Today we're going to have a little bit of fodder fun. Hey, it's Care. Welcome to Monte at the Lake. I have this fabulous old English textbook. English Writers, the revised edition. I wish I could remember what year it was from. All of the pages in it are beautifully, naturally aged. They're a creamy color anyway, and many of them have caramelization around the edges. I harvested this book. I took out all the pictures because it had lots of pictures of classic literature authors and some of the places of interest. It had quite a few really cool pictures. This is a hashtag this inspired me and the this inspired me video is from I think it's Jenny. Maybe it's Jeannie. I'm sorry. I, I'm new to her channel and I've not heard her say her name now that I think about it. But It's G-E-N-I Jeannie's Mixed Media Journals. And she does all kinds of journal, junk journal stuff. She makes a truckload of journals and she's got some really, really good ideas. Some time-saving ideas and some time-honored ideas. And one of the things I saw, and if I can go back and grab a screenshot, I will show you where the inspiration for this book came from. Literally, it was a torn off piece of old book that she had painted two squares on and outlined them in black and white or black and brown or something and she tore it out of a book page and she glued it onto one of the embellishments I think that she was making for her junk journals. Those two squares lit something in my brain and I thought oh I want to do a whole book of those. I want it to be color coordinated so that when I need a piece of fodder I can just go to the purple section and grab some purple fodder and I was off to the races. I, ha I wrote down a whole bunch of ideas on different things that I want to put in here and different ways that I want to do things. That night I started this. Before we get started on that, I'll, I'll show you. So this was a textbook in a high school, probably. It's, it's so funny because this was probably high school back in the 60s and 70s. And this stuff now would blow high school children's minds. This level of literature is now college freshman material because kids now just can't, they can't be bothered to think that hard. So this was an old textbook. I'm thinking high school grade, and they scribbled all over it. And it drives me crazy because it's not good doodles it's just crap you know it's it's dirty more than anything and so i've been trying to figure out what i wanted to do to remedy that i know what i wanted it to look like but i didn't want to take the time to do it and so canva to the rescue and i made this and just by happenstance the color is almost exact even though my my printer is yet again running out of ink i've been printing a lot i'm just gonna tear this up I shouldn't have folded it like that, but I did. Oh, tear well. off that misprinted. Usually I embrace it, but because there's no yellow here, I don't want any yellow here. I'm going to tear that off. It's not perfect. I don't mean it to be. I don't want it or need it to be. I'm going to cover anything up except for his doodling. And I say his because I know there was a boy's name in the this book belongs to page there. I'm going to glue that on there. Figure out a way maybe with gesso or some kind of acrylic paint to soften up those edges just a little bit. But the next time you see this, this fodder fun will be attached to the cover and hopefully it'll look like it's always been there. So let me show you the around on the inside and you can see if you want to stick around because I'm going to do a few pages just because I feel like doing a few pages. This is just for fodder. The idea here is you can tear out these pages. I only did one side of the paper so there are no heavy decisions to be made of which side to use. These little bits can just be torn out and put on a master board or put on a piece of collage or put on an embellishment or used in a cluster or used as faux washi tape or just to add a splash of color where you have a blank spot. The uses are endless really. Also for page edging, I'm doing a lot on this side of the page and so if I wanted to tear that and use it as page edging or a page wrap and then that leaves me more of these. And the way that I have laid this out is in the color of the spectrum. I just started with blue instead of red and 
in the beginning of each color I'm blending them so the next the color that comes before blue is green and so this is kind of a bluish green and several of the front pages here are bluish green and the reason I'm doing it this way is so that it's easy to find a color that I want I don't want to have to flip through the whole book to find a bluish green something or other and I recently did a video on the magazine fodder where you just go through your magazines and doodle and then cut them out I really like that but I also like doing it on my own colors and so that's where this is coming from this one happens to have little tiny stars printed on it and so I used that I did spatter it some just to junk it up a little bit some spirals just it can be whatever you want it to be I, I didn't doodle on all of them. Maybe I don't want them doodled on. Maybe I want to stamp something on this eventually or stencil over it. Or so I can use, you know, just just one of the circles. I can use a pair or a, the whole thing or all six and then doodle them all up together. I can use bigger squares like this. I can use the whole strip. There's all kinds of options. Some pages I just threw watercolor on and some salt to get that effect. Now I can go through here and do some of those magazine type doodles. Doodle some fodder on there if I want. I can use these as just for page edging or for tabs. Tear out a whole bunch, cut them into rectangles and, and use them as page tabs in a bluish green or a lake journal, or an ocean journal, or a beach journal, or a, anything that has, in, you know, it doesn't have to match in everybody's world. So there's, there's a few of the bluish green. This I just cleaned off my brush so that I could go into a different color. So I'll probably add more to this. But what I love about this is that it's all English literature. So when I cut this out and glue it in something, it's not just miscellaneous text from a magazine. It's classic literature. <laughs> I love that. I just love that. And there are pages and pages and pages. And so many, many, many of the embellishments that I make are going to have a background of English literature. And that makes my heart glad. I wanted a book that was at least nine inches tall because generally speaking, that's as big as I go with my pages. And this is exactly nine inches tall. I just happened to luck out with that. Originally, I thought, well, it'd be fun to do it in a in just a paperback, but I wanted the page edging option. So it had to be a little bit taller than a paperback. This is sort of like cleaning off my brushes and my books of unwasted paint. This is very much paint used on purpose though, but as I was getting ready to do some in the purple, because I was bored with the blue and green, I wanted to do some purple, I just wiped off the brush as if it were a book of unwasted paint. I could come back and add to this if I want to. That is all I did in the blue and green, but I did some purple. Now this is a very bluish purple because it's at the end of blue and the beginning of purple and so I wanted it to have a lot of blue in the mix a blue violet and so that's what these first few pages are so when I go back to the purples I am going to just start doing just purple and I'm gonna do lilacs and I'm gonna do darker purples and lighter purples and in every color block at the end, I'm gonna mix it with some browns so that if I have a vintage project that I'm working on that needs vintage and purple, I'll have some browns to play with as well. Another thing that I plan to do at the back of each of the color blocks is some color wheels and color chips and things that are real artsy, watercolory, kind of like last year's Tim Holtz collage paper that came out, I think it was last year. Carrie at Mixed Media, Carrie's Mixed Media Arts, now it's Carrie Gibson Art. She did some of her own versions of that, that Tim Holtz collage paper and it's magnificent. So I want to do something similar with all kinds of colors in the back of each so that I have a huge range. I have every color under the spectrum plus with some vintage plus all colors. I may at, may at the very back do some just black and white stuff because and it would have to be black and cream and white because <laughs> this is such an old book compared to you know new. you can see how yellow 
how creamy the pages are. So I'll just show you a few more pages. This, this of course, is salt. If you're wondering why that looks so amazing, it's because when it was still sort of wet, I spattered it with water. And when it was still sort of wet, I added salt to it. I'll, I'll be doing some more of those pages so you'll be able to see. And this is fun. I can jump, when I get bored, I can jump to a different color. So this, this is ending the purple and starting the red. So this is going to be a very magenta red, a very purplish red at first. And then I will get to the redder reds and pinks and lighter reds and darker reds and reds with browns toward the back for the vintage stuff. Lots of squares because that's where it started out. Lots of circles because they're easy. Just patterns. These are just small circles done in layers, really light ones when that was dry. I did the medium ones when that was dry. I came back with the dark ones. Same thing, different shape, kind of a plaid. Now this I could do some ink work on or doodle on or use it as is. Any of these can have Posca pen or Micron pen, fine liner pen, marker. You can do anything over this stamping. Let's just grab a stamp and do a stamp over it just to see. How cool that would look. I just happen to have a brand new, new to me, fern stamp. That's handy. I'm going to hit it with archival ink, waterproof. Because who knows how much I'm going to, what else I might do with this. Kind of cool. Got four more ink stamps off of that. I don't want to do any more on here. So I just did them on here. Those would be fun, torn up into and used in collage. Nothing ever goes to waste. Plus, I wanted to clean the ink off my stamp. You know, once it, it's going to dry, the next time I pick the stamp up will probably be six months from now. So I don't want it to get ruined. I'm going to do some writing, just some weird writing. This is a fantastic low energy. You want to do something creative, but you don't have much creative energy. This is it. This is, it doesn't get any easier than this. So that was fun. I love that. I like the stamp on it. Okay. So again, just some, I can, I can do all kinds of things here. I can doodle, I can use it as strips. I can stamp on this. I can doodle some stuff on here and cut those out. I can do all kinds of things. This is gonna be orange, but because it's the end of the red, I'm doing some reddish orange, red mixed with orange. And that's, I think, as far as I, oh, I did some yellow, but it's at the end of the orange, so I didn't rub the salt off. Now, the salt works best in the bluish colors, especially ultramarine. It barely did anything to these yellows and oranges, so don't waste the salt. You know, if you know the colors aren't going to work, don't don't waste your time because it's a chemical reaction. It, all the colors are different chemicals. They don't always react the same with the salt. Some page edging some doodles so since we haven't done anything in the green we're gonna go to the green and it's gonna be a yellow green because at the end of the yellow beginning of the green oh i wasn't thinking i should have sprayed my my uh, watercolor here before i started i'm on another campaign to educate people who want to do watercolor <laughs> I've been working with my little Cotman set a lot, and those are pan colors that came with the set, except for a couple that I filled in with my tube colors. And holy man, I don't have to wet everything, I guess. I can just wet the green and the yellow, because that's what I'm going to work on. Oh, wet it all. I might work on this a little while longer. I don't know. I don't know. So we're just going to let this sit for a minute. But these are tube colors. When I wet them, it's going to take about no time at all for them to be nice and juicy. When I wet my pan colors i have to re-wet them and re-wet them and re-wet them and re-wet them and most of my painting time is spent re-wetting the freaking pan colors they are baked into those little pieces of chalk that are crammed into those those sets i i will never buy pan color never never i have two great travel sets three travel palettes these can be considered travel they they go pretty readily all over the place too i have absolutely no need for pan colors whatsoever. The tube colors are juicy all the time, juicy. And the pan colors never, ever get juicy. And by juicy, I mean just luscious, wonderful, vibrant, saturated is a good word. Just, it's like night and day to me. And so if you're thinking about watercolor, 
please, please, please get yourself decent watercolors, at least Cotman student grade Windsor Newton, at least. Or get yourself a, a good set of primaries. Daniel Smith has a primary kit. Windsor and Newton has a primary kit of their artist grade quality. Red, yellow, blue, and black sometimes, which you don't really need, but buy tube, buy tube, buy tube. All right, that should be enough time for this to have gotten workable and I have no space here. I am working on a completely cluttered desk. I'm tilting it because that's how my left hand works. So I have a lot of green already on the palette. There's no reason to, to start anywhere else. I'm just gonna get this page wet. I have, uh, I think what's a fairly new subscriber, I, I believe her name is Victoria. In one of the comments on another video, she said she had a lot of family members who were pissed at her because she's tearing up books. And I totally get, I get that. I, I almost threw up the first time I saw a junk journal, quote unquote, gut a book. Oh my God, are you kidding me? You know, books to me are like Bibles. You just don't do that, you know? They're even more than Bibles in my brain. Having someone just tear it up, especially being an author, being a book lover and a book collector. Oh my God, you just don't do that. <laughs> you just don't do that. However, I've gotten over it. You know, the first one that I gutted was difficult, but I did it. Like Julia Childs said when she was deboning her first chicken you know sometimes you just have to go for it you just have to do it and and soak it up and and do it and i told victoria that tell her family and friends that we're giving them a new life this is a very old textbook it's not going to be used in a classroom anymore. Libraries are not going to check them out because no one is interested in an old textbook of English literature. They're sad but true. They're just not interested in it. P.S. Remember when you're working in watercolor, it's always going to dry back about 20%. So if it seems way too bright, know that it's going to dry back 20%. So if it's way too bright, you're right on, t you're right on target. Anyway, we're giving these books new life. They're destined for dumpsters and landfills, and we are now giving them new and different life. It's another way to enjoy a book. What I forgot to mention in that reply to her comment was this. I used to work at a Walden Books, and booksellers destroy books by the garbage bag full every single day of the year they pull the covers off so they can't be resold and they get thrown into a dumpster and trashed booksellers do it all day every day it's disgusting they do it with magazines they do it with paperback books i've never torn up a hardcover at a bookstore but it's common practice it's disturbing it's horrible I know it didn't work in the yellow and orange. I'm going to try it here. This is my compilation salt. It's every salt I ever had in the house. Wow, that's a lot of salt. Sea salt, pink salt, flake salt, pickling salt, canning salt, kosher salt. McDonald's salt is the bulk of it because that's the best stuff for some reason. I don't know if it's the cut or what, but wow. Also, while it's still kind of wet, sort of drying, I'm going to take some water and just give it some spatters. That gives you some lovely blossoms and blooms as that wet water moves the drying paint. Okay, I want to go down to the next page, but I don't want these two to stick together, so I'm just going to find something like this to put here. So I can paint on this page. This one I'll do, um, I'm going to skip a few because I want a few more of those just full of color pages. But I know you've seen it once, you don't need to see that again. Let's do some of the squares and stuff. Whenever I watercolor, I try to always keep Kleenex either in my hand or at hand. Because I want to, want to load this up with color, whatever green is on there. And I want to take out a lot of that water, but I want to leave some pigment at the top. So I'm pressing, I'm pressing on that belly right here, belly of the brush, and getting out the water, but leaving some paint. Because I don't want this to run all over the place. 
I want to just be able to, and that's mostly water in there, not a lot of paint. So I'm going to go into my, my paint and put some water down, put some paint down. And I'm just going to make some circles. The size is entirely up to you. How big do you think you're going to use? They don't have to be perfect. I do try to keep them about the same size in the same row. Now, again, I want these yellowish green, yellow and green. So I'm picking up some yellow and putting that in there. Kind of a lime green, lemon green. This is very meditative, very relaxing. Put on a good movie, put on some beautiful music, listen to the birds outside, and just doodle. This is no brain stuff. You don't have to think real hard about it. I'm gonna make the next one, I'm gonna do a layer of really light little squares and then come back with medium squares and then dark squares. But each layer has to dry before you put the other one on. So while these are drying, we can go on and do something else. These are pretty light. I don't even know if you can see them. Remember, you can always zoom in if you're on a mobile device or a tablet, just like you do with your photos. You just zoom in and zoom out on YouTube, you can zoom in and get really close. You can get right down to my brushwork here and see exactly what these little squares look like if you want to, and I'm not zooming enough. I'm not zooming because I'm painting. You zoom. And if you're on a mobile device and you can see this subscribe button, watch what it does when I say the word subscribe. Make sure to like this video and subscribe <laughs> it lights up and I think there's confetti. It's super fun. It's kind of scary because it knows what I'm saying. It knows what my, my recording is saying. I'm astonished every day at how people, how many people use YouTube every day and have absolutely no idea how to use it <laughs> or how it works. Like people who complain about the ads that they're seeing to the creator as if we have any any, 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 any control over the ads you see. We have some control as to how many. We have some control over where they're placed. Well, that's it. And we all see different ads on the same video. If you're watching this video and you're a dog lover, you might get pet supplies and Chewy and anything that you may have Googled before or looked up before, you'll see ads related to that. If you're a cat person, you won't see the dog ads. You'll see something completely different. We all have completely different ads experience. And yet, people will complain, Oh, it's so funny, I'm watching a video on weight loss and, and there's a Dairy Queen ad. Ha ha ha, who thought that was a good idea? YouTube. It's YouTube and Google. They did it. We didn't do it. But people who watch don't have any idea how that's how it works. You know, it's crazy to me. So while those little tiny squares are drying, I'm going to put in some squares down here, some bigger ones. And I love... I may have already said this, but I, I'm just tickled still at the idea that all of my, all of my ephemera and my embellishment, not ephemera, embellishments that I make, what's the difference? Ephemera is something that's used for daily use, meant for daily use, one time use, a movie ticket, a receipt, a bar napkin, 
maybe some matchbooks for a few multi one purpose uses and then you throw it away it's daily use stuff embellishments are all these things that we make little pockets and tucks and belly bands and those are all the things we make we can make faux ephemera we can do that but all of my embellishments will have classic english literature behind them and that that just tickles me skinny as my dad would say let's see what else can we do we can do the x's and pick up some yellow even though that is pretty yellowish green and I, I quite like the color of those X's, so I'm just going to go in with that yellow I just picked up and put in some dots in between. What I like, too, is that I'm, I'm going to leave all this intact until I start cutting it apart. And as I cut it apart, I'm going to start at the page edge and work toward the, toward the spine. So it should pretty well stay intact. It won't be just the fodder all over the place. It'll, it'll be pretty easily managed and i like that what else can i make here how about some bigger circles going back to here i did not hit that with with the dryer to speed up the drying because as watercolor dries it continues to move and to change and whatnot and if you hit it with the dryer that heat and that hot air just stops that action people who teach watercolor on youtube all day every day who hit it with a dryer in between every layer that's fine if you're doing photorealism or something where you don't want the movement of the watercolor. You want it to stay right where you put it. I mean, I get it. There are certainly applications for it. But quite often, the people who are doing it are doing loose watercolor. And, and they, they want the liveliness. And they want the energy that moving watercolor has. And they hit it with a hairdryer. And they say, I'm going to let that dry and hit it with a hairdryer. Those are two completely different things. One is stopping every bit of action. And one is letting it dry naturally and letting it do what it's going to do. The reason we love watercolor, most of us, is for all the energy and movement that it has. Nothing else moves like watercolor. Why in the world would you want to stop it? Again, I get it. There are certain applications where you do photorealism in watercolor. You don't want shit sliding all over the place. That's where you really, when you do photorealism, you layer it starting at the very palest of pale colors and you layer and you layer and you layer to get the photorealism. It takes a lot of patience and a lot of time. Hitting it with a hairdryer can sometimes help, but it's really not the answer. I get it in, in acrylic. Acrylic doesn't move like watercolor. I get it. Gesso, hit it with a hairdryer. I'm all in. But watercolor, leave it be. Let it do its thing. So even in this, I'm not going to... Because I like all the different stuff that's happening. I like all the different where it's pooling like because this is curling into that spine i don't know if you can see right here there's a pool of paint that's where that's going to dry so that square is going to be darker on that side this one it pooled sort of on a curve so the top half on a diagonal is lighter than that bottom half if you hit it with a hair dryer it's going to move all over the place it's not going to dry with those beautiful characteristics uh, some water and throw some yellow in here just for good measure okay i think you can tell when a watercolor is dry when you put the back of your finger on it and it's still cool it's not dry there's still a lot of water in it test test it someplace where there isn't any water and then test it where where you have watercolor and you can feel a temperature difference. Test it with the back of your hand because the front of your hand's all oily and you don't, water and oil don't mix. So you don't want to glom up, you know, get oily fingerprints all over the place. So I'm not going to go back to those just yet. Sometimes I have to go back here and look at other things that I've done 
to remind myself of things that I want to do. What did I do here? Squares, dot, squares, plaid. Another thing that I did before. Is just some movement. This you have to do, if you're doing it in watercolor, you have to have a pretty dry, Not it's not dry brush, but if I have a lot of water in here, they just, they just blend together and you can't see those brush strokes that I'm working to get here. <laughs> so this is also really good practice for you to know your water to paint ratio. How watery does it have to be? in order for you to still control it. And you can absolutely control watercolor through practice like this, so you know how much water to how much paint. It absolutely can be controlled. Okay, let's go back to these little squares up here. So these are really light. I want something that's a little bit darker, but not super dark, a medium. And I'm going to overlap them hither and yon, just here and there. I'm trying to make them about the same size, about the same shape, but they're not exact, and that's all right. I'm going to put just a couple medium ones here and there. You probably cannot hear it, but it sounds like 101 Dalmatians outside my window right now. <laughs> They're all alerting each other about something. Every neighborhood dog out there is talking to each other. Another beautiful day in the hood. Middle of October. Super sunny. 70 degrees. I am so sick of it. I'm ready for fall, please. Now they kind of sort of all look the same that there isn't a huge difference between the medium and the light. But when we put the super dark one down, then they'll all sort of separate and, and you'll be able to see clearly. All right, what else can we do? While we're waiting for those medium ones to dry, we'll do, oh, let's do some more X's. I really like how that, I like this green. If you have ideas, jot them in the comments below. What would you put in here? What kind of doodle marks or fodder marks or things would you make in here? Are you thinking that you want to make one of these too? Would you would you make one of these? I think it's a great idea myself. <laughs> if I do say so myself, I love this idea of having at the ready all the time, number one, something to do. Something to play with that's fun and easy, that's not too terribly taxing on a creative brain. And number two, 
something colorful and ready all the time. I can tear into this at any given moment. And as I think of things, I have a list in here. It's not handy because I took it out to check it for something earlier. That was a good idea because now I don't know where it is. But you notice a theme. I say that almost every video. I'd show you, but I don't know where it is. I'd show you, but I can't find it. I'd show you, but I, uh, I had it a minute ago and now it's been eaten by this room. It irritates me too. Anyway, I just keep adding to that list of things that I see that I want to put in here, things that I, ideas that come up that I want to put in here. I just keep that right in the front of the book and add to it all the time. As the ideas come up, I jot them down. And then when I sit down here to do this, I don't have to think about, what am I going to do now? What am I going to put in here this time? I just do it. I just, I have something ready to go. So I started with squares, fairly decent shape and size square, sort of. And now they're in rectangle shape. Ugh. They were in a nice line, now they're not. And that's okay. I'll either tear them up separately or figure out a way to make them work together or not. These are still kind of wet, so I'm throwing in some of that yellow and maybe some little bit of darker green while they're still kind of wet. Eee, that's a lot. Probably not quite done yet, but I'm ready to move on, so we're going to come down here and work on the the dark, dark circles. This is mostly pigment, just enough water to help it move. This is the same thing if you saw in the earlier pictures. It's from the book Watercolor for the Soul where you just do the layers. There's the small squares. There's also triangles, circles, and little leaf shapes. Super easy. Not a lot of creative energy spent here. But you get to feel creative. I watercolored today. I played with my watercolors today. I made fodder for my journals today. I worked on my fodder collection today. And you know, it's just all good. <laughs> And there's no rush, no reason to hurry through this. Just enjoy playing with your toys. Know that with every stroke you make in this kind of project, you are learning more about your watercolor, what the colors do, how much water to paint, what your brushes do, what kind of strokes do they make, when is dry enough, dry enough, and not. All good lessons that don't actually feel like lessons, but you're, what you're doing is building muscle memory, mental muscle memory, physical muscle memory. Yeah. What shall we do here? Maybe just a plaid. Different green. Look how much further back. When I was doing the little squares, I was holding it like a pencil so I have more control over my where my brush is going. But I'm back here now, loosening up on that and just pulling those lines. How you hold your brush makes a big difference in things. The looser you want to be, the further back you hold your brush. Sometimes I paint holding just the tippy tippy top of it and just, especially when I'm doing washes and whatnot. And the, the further down you get, usually you're clutching it, you're gripping really hard. That's too detailed and, well, not too detailed, but 
for detail work when you're up close and personal and you're doing some super, super tiny detail. You're nose to nose with it and you're really close up to it. For the most part, watercolor, I tend to hold in the middle. Not too tight, not too up close, not too personal. Just putting some dots in those plaids just for some interest. It's kind of yellow, kind of green like the rest of it. this page come out well I suspected the salt didn't really do much it's still not dry so I'm gonna spatter some more water just because at this point too you can spatter some paint you can spatter paint anytime you want By tilting it up, wherever the water goes, the paint will follow. So if I want to bring those drips down, help the water move a little bit. I'm just gonna let that dry. I'm gonna go get a nice hot cup of tea, and maybe do some more pages, but you get the gist, right? You get the idea here that grab an old book. If size doesn't matter to you, then use a paperback, although that might not stay intact as well, but you can do just a few pages at a time. You don't have to do the entire spectrum. You know, how I tend to do things is all or nothing. I I don't know it's a it's a problem whenever I'm done watercoloring too once I've cleaned my brush out really well I clean it in the dirty brought water and then I swish it around in the clean water and I, I as I'm drying it I roll it on my pad my drying pad and before I put it back in its little holder I make it come to a point again like that I just with my fingers and I'm rolling it and twisting it so that I'm bringing that to a nice point while it's wet and I let my brushes dry I tilt them so they have just a tiny bit of tilt when I lay them down I make sure that they're tilting downward a little bit not touching anything because I don't want that the bristles to get bent and dry but I want it to be on a downward angle enough for whatever moisture is in here to come out through the bristles out through the bristles and dry out through the bristles and dry versus just throwing it back upward in my jar whatever moisture is in here is going to get down it's just going to dry down in there into the glue that's holding those together now they're glued and crimped you know and tied ideally up in there but i don't want anything to come apart and so i've always dried my brushes like that even if it's just a tiny bit or even if it's just horizontal it's better than vertical until they're dry and then I throw them back in my cup. Alrighty, well I hope you enjoyed this sort of a process video idea. I hope that you go to Peyton and start your own and uh, let me know if you're gonna try this. I'd love to know. Till we meet again, go love up your beastlies. Mate at the lake. Oh, we're not.